Ah, okay. So, first of all, uh, there is a request uh, from uh, some of you to have uh, the exam of uh, uh, next week uh, on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, because so they say uh, they could concentrate on just the exam of uh, Wolpert and have some more time to study for the exam of Rufo. Is this okay with everyone? Stefano Ruffo, of the course on long-range systems. On Friday, you will only have uh, the exam of, uh, of Wolpert, okay? Okay, okay, very good. You can just put it on the Slack channel. Uh, of <coughs> Rufo's uh, course, okay? Okay, then... Uh, um, okay, so then I think uh, we can start uh, with the seventh lecture of... Uh, Stefano Rufo's course, uh, which I think uh, is a special guest. Yes. And um, so okay. are we recording? I guess. Uh, recording yes. in progress. Okay. So can you can you hear? So so as uh, I told you, uh, I um, I have uh, invited uh, Nicolò De Fenu who is currently a postdoc at uh, ETH Zurich and is connected today from, uh, from Boston uh, uh, to give the, uh, the uh, second part of the lecture course. Because Nicolò, he, he did uh, his uh, PhD at CISA working on uh, several aspects of uh, long-range interactions. So his uh, uh, first contributions were to understanding uh, critical exponents of, of long-range interacting systems uh, by devising uh, some uh, special renormalization group approach for these uh, systems. Uh, then he went on and uh, he has now collected a series of uh, very interesting results on uh, on uh, long-range interactions uh, in uh, the quantum domain. So I thought it he was the most appropriate person to, to talk about this uh, to you. So uh, I, I will leave the floor to Nicolò uh, for his uh, presentation. Uh, so it's now uh, four, uh, four uh, six. I think uh, uh, even if we make a short break, uh, uh, we could finish for 5.30, 5, 5.40 uh, with this presentation. Uh, and I will act, uh, and also I will be helped by Matteo, if I understand uh, well, some person in, in the hall will also collect the questions, okay? Emanuele, Emanuele will collect uh, the, 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 the questions, and I, I will also connect to Zoom and... Uh, have a look at the chat to see if there are uh, questions. So, Nicolò, I will act you as your assistant in this uh, lecture course. Uh, I see Thank the you, faces Stefan. of the students, and uh, so I can see if they, they open their eyes. And <laughs> they, so uh, I cannot see, unfortunately, the rest of the face. So we are, we are masked, but OK. So, uh, so, Nicolò, I leave you the floor for the presentation of so the first uh, talk will be about uh, sort of all-to-all -all quantum uh, systems and uh, and uh, what happens if you if you add quantum mechanics to all-to-all -all, uh, quantum systems. Okay. So good morning, everybody. I hope the slides are visible. It seems so. Um, yes. Yes, they are visible from. Very good. So, well, first of all, let me thank Stefano for inviting me here, for giving this very nice introduction of my work and my research. I guess uh, 
in this in this situation we we are mostly focused on something which is uh, pedagogical so that you can understand a little bit the basics of uh, long range systems uh, quantum system with long range interactions you are probably much warmer than I am. So this is my first lecture that I will be teaching here while you already have uh, six or, or maybe four. I know six because it's the seventh. So you already had six lecture and, and so you are much warmer so we can dive directly in. Most of what I'm gonna say, you can find it in, in this archive preprint that you will find online. It's basically a review that has been written by myself and also Stefano is between the authors and there are also other collaborators of us. So most of what I will be saying during the lecture can be found in this review. The review is not completely pedagogical because it's a scientific review, but at least you can find references therein which are more pedagogical. So this we are going to roughly follow what's written in the review in a more pedagogical way. And I can give you further references when you... Sorry? No, no, nothing, sorry. Okay. And by any way, you are welcome to ask questions, both regarding the physics and the references at any moment while I'm speaking. Okay, so the first part of, the, of this lecture is gonna be, is gonna dealing with um, systems, so how to realize long range interactions in quantum systems. And this, I have to say that uh, it's, kind of a quite recent field. Um, it has been, uh, it has started developing around uh, 10 years, maybe, maybe a little bit more. And it's probably started uh, with this kind of, so the, the example you see here in the top, uh, which is a platform of trapped ions. And trapped ions are be, have been the first one where, uh, where allowed us to realize long range interactions, uh, which have a tunable decay exponents. I don't need to define what is long range interaction for you because you have already had several lectures. It's just a two body potential. So it's a system where the two body interaction potential within the particles or the spins or any microscopic component of the system decays as a power law alpha. In the quantum regime, as I was saying, we have a few examples to that, that can realize this kind of long range interaction potential. And most of them are found in the case of atomic systems, so atomic and optical systems, uh, where long range interactions are mediate, are realized uh, in, thanks to the mediation of some, um, some bosonic particle that can be phonon or photon. And this that I'm, that I'm showing you here are the most celebrated example of long range interacting quantum systems. The one here on the right is a system of quantum gases trapped in an optical cavity. And the one on the top is, uh, as I said, trapped ion system at low temperature. The one on the left is not an atomic system. The one on the left is a more traditional system. It's a condensed matter system, a film of mag a, a magnetic film. So this is a film, I think, of iron or copper where long range interactions are somehow naturally, so they are not engineered, like in the case of trapped ions or cavity systems, they are somehow naturally realized due to the fact that the atoms in the, in the, in the thin ferromagnetic film have a dipolar interactions. And so you see the, the long range interactions in this condensed matter system realize this kind of stripe behavior or lamelle, which is very interesting, but unfortunately it's not what we are gonna be talking about is just to show that there are not just synthetic systems, synthetic quantum systems with long range interactions, but there are also natural ones. As I say, as I already said in, during these lectures, we are going to mostly focus on the synthetic ones because the synthetic ones are, are a better playground for theory in some sense. Uh, they are a system where long range interactions can engineer the, in an environment which is highly tunable and controllable. And this make it in such a way that we have more, we have more or less the, the possibility to realize our favorite, uh, see our favorite theoretical situation in an environment where the, the phenomena are easily observable and controlled. This, the first case I'm gonna describe is the case of trapped ions. And trapped ions, so as the name says, they are ions. 
which are cooled at a very low temperature thanks to laser cooling. If you are not expert in uh, AMO devices in, in cold atom, just take my word with a grain of salt. This is just to give you a glimpse, an intuitive understanding of what's gonna, so of why long range interactions are important and how we can use AMO devices to realize long range interactions. So basically, as I said, we, we are gonna talk about a system of trapped ions and the ions are uh, here trapped into a, an electro, uh, what is called a pending trap. So you see basically the atoms are charged particles. In this case, they are beryllium plus, but this is not so important. What is important is that they are positively charged particles. And so they are confined in the plane by the fact that there is an electric field here. No, this, is a, this, is a, this plane is at a negative potential. So the ions like to lie in this plane. And since they are at very low temperature, they form a crystal. So ions are charged particles at very low temperature. They form a crystal because they have to arrange a way to minimize their interaction potential, which is long range, is the Coulomb interaction potential. And so they form a crystal. But the ions also have an internal degrees of freedom. So they basically, they basically have a electronic degrees of freedom. And so we can be, we can have ions which are in a state zero or in a state one. So the ions have also a spin degree of freedom on top of them. And this spin degree of freedom interact by some kind of, by interaction which are mediated by the crystal phonons. So basically if you, um, so if you see it here, the, there is a coupling between the spin of the ion. So each ion is a spin which occupies the place on this lattice and the value of the spin is coupled to the position of the ion. So this ZI is the position of the ions on this plane. And so it's, it's coupled to the position of the ion. So there is a coupling in the Hamiltonian between spin, between the spatial and the, uh, between the spatial degree of freedom and the spin degree of freedom. And this coupling can be tuned thanks to the presence of some uh, electromagnetic field. In this case, are there some uh, uh, laser beams that you see entering here from the from the from the plates, and by tuning the the shape of these laser fields, the angle in which the laser fields are somehow imprinted on the crystal, we can realize different kind of interaction potential between the spins, because you see the the spin is coupled to the emotional degree to the spatial degree, but the spatial degree can be expanded in contribution from phonons, the phonons of the crystal, which are this bi and bj, but the phonons of the crystal can then be integrated out so they can be removed from the Hamiltonian because they are very fast. They, are, they have a line scale that, are, that is very um, short with respect to the one of the ions. And when, they, when the phonons are integrated out, we get a spin-spin interaction. So basically the spin can exchange one phonon and so the interaction between the spin is mediated. And when they spin in, in exchange such a phonon and the, inter, and the quadratic spin interaction is, uh, is mediated, we can also tune the coupling between the spins, uh, which is this JIJ, by just tuning the property of the phonons. And the property of the phonons, as I said, they are tuned by these fields, by these this laser fields that you see here. And this is basically a way to realize tunable long range interactions. So we are realizing an Hamiltonian of spins. Here I just took the, the spin part, the interaction spin part in this Hamiltonian. And the, this interaction decays as a power law and the power law alpha depend on how, what is the, the angle of this imprinted uh, laser fields. And you see that I can tune different kind of interactions. So this is, this is a plot. This is a plot of the, of the JIJ as a function of the spin-spin separation. And you see that depending on the frequency and on the angle, one can find different uh, interaction potential, we have alpha equal to zero, sorry, this A, it means alpha, so it's the power law of the decay interaction, of the interaction decay. 
So alpha here is very small, basically zero, and then we can increase it by changing the frequency of this laser beam or actually the, the shift in frequency between the laser beams. And you see, we can realize basically a, a kind of a large range of interactions, uh, powers, so, so basically the interaction that we can realize have alpha that goes from zero to basically three. And it's, uh, this is a very wide range of tuning parameters uh, and it's, uh, it's very good for, for realized models that, that are interesting in theory. So this is a first example. So with trapped ions, we can realize long range interactions. We can realize long range interaction that decay with a power law that we can tune basically almost as much as we want. I show you the two dimensional realization. There is also a one dimensional realization in which one can tune the range of the, in, of the interaction power law. Now we go to another kind of system, which is particularly interesting for us. It doesn't have the tunability of the trapped ions simulator. Uh, it only allows to realize strong long range interaction, which are basically flat, so alpha equal to zero, which I believe is the case that Stefan was treated the most uh, in the previous lecture. So the case of very flat interactions. And in this, kind of, uh, in this kind of system, the interactions are mediated by light. So they are mediated by photon. Mm -hmm. So in summary, the example of before had tunable power law interactions, which were mediated by crystal phonons. So here we have a non-tunable, so a flat uh, long range interaction, which is mediated by the photons. How do we realize this? We, we take a gas of particle, a quantum gas, so even in this case, the gas, these are atoms which are cooled at very low temperature, so basically they, they behave quantumly, there is a large super, super, superposition between the wave function of the, of the atoms, and these atoms are trapped into an optical cavity. An optical cavity is just basically a two mirrors, you know, two reflective mirrors with a very high finesse, which basically means that you can have, uh, you can trap some radiation into the cavity because it's bounced forth and back by the mirrors. And when the atoms are trapped into the optical cavity, uh, basically they, they are interacting with some nearest neighbor interaction, which you see here, this is G, this is the, this is the Hamiltonian of the atoms. It has some nearest neighbor interaction, which is this term here. Uh, and it, it, it has, the atoms are, can move, so they have their momentum, but they are also uh, coupled to a pump. So there is a laser field which is shined on the atoms. And this laser field, it's very important that it's shined transversally, no? So the cavity, it's longitudinal, is on the, uh, the x-axis, while the laser comes from the, uh, it's directed towards the y-axis, so it comes transversally. So this is the setup that most people are dealing with. And what happens is that the, the cavity, so the pump sends photon into the cavity, as I say, transversally. One atom can scatter a photon from the pump and it gets some momentum uh, along the diagonal. And it also scatters, is this scattering effect as, a, as an effect, it produces a photon that goes into the cavity longitudinally. So you see, we are pumping transversely, but the scattering of the light with the atoms generates some, some photon to go longitudinally so that they can be reflected from the mirrors. And then there can be another scattering from the photon uh, to the atom in such a way that the photon goes back into the pump, so it becomes longitudinal again, and the second atom, it's imprinted an opposite momentum in the other direction. So you see, it's a basically um, a two atom process. And this two atom process involves three photons, two photons from the pump and one photon from the cavity. 
the, the contribution of the photon of the pump can be removed. So we can go to the rotating wave approximation and we can remove the contribution of the photon in the pump. And so basically we see this as a scattering between the cavity photon and the atom. And this is what is described by this um, Hamiltonian here, which is the coupling between atom and cavity. And you see basically this is exactly, so psi is the atomic uh, creation and annihilation operator, so it's the atomic operator. And you see that this is the term that is responsible for the scattering of the photons. And this term is proportional both to the cavity mode, which tells you basically what is the distribution of the, photo, of the photon mode in the cavity, but is also proportional to the pump mode, which the operator has been eliminated, but it remains a contribution from the, like, from how is the intensity profile of the pump field that you see here. Well, obviously there are also higher order effect with the covering of the photon, but these are not so important. They are not, they are just a shift in the energy of the atoms and the, and the cavity, which is not so important at this stage. So very good. This is the atom cavity, atom Hamiltonian and the cavity Hamiltonian. I guess you know how it works because the cavity Hamiltonian is just the cavity is a single mode cavity, so it has just one photonic mode with a certain frequency, which is called delta because it's in the rotating wave of the pump. So it's the shift of the cavity frequency from the pump frequency, nothing much. Very good. So the, the, coupling, the coupling between the photon and the atoms I've already explained, it, and it's roughly proportional to the uh, to the Rabi frequency, and the Rabi frequency is calculated by the pump intensity, which is this omega, and the delta, which is the basically the line width of the atom. So even in this case, we are talking about atoms which have two states. And so delta A is just the, the line width between the ground state and the excited state of the atoms. And as I say, the scattering process is a two-fold. Nicolò, there is a question from, uh, from the old. Prego, prego. I have a question. I don't understand the term with uh, g lower case half times uh, psi dagger psi in uh, the second Hamiltonian. This one? Yeah, what does it represent? This is just the interaction between the atoms. Okay. So you see, this is the, this is the atom annihilation operator, the atom creation operator. The atoms are bosons, okay? So it's a density-density interaction between the atoms, which is local. It's just, a, it's just to account for the fact that these atoms are repulsive bosons, and sometimes when they meet, when they, meet they, they just repel each other. Okay, thank you. Okay, in, in some sense, uh, this term is the one that is less important uh, from the point of view of the description of the long-range interacting system, because we are interested in the interaction which is mediated by the photon. But one has to consider that these are anyway our core bosons, uh, so when they meet, uh, they repel each other. Well, uh, okay, so as I was saying, so there is this process which, uh, which scatter the atom, which is in the ground state. So remember that this is a quantum gas to start with. So the, the atoms are mostly in a condensate with zero momentum. And when they scatter a photon from the pump and then from in the cavity and then back on the pump, they acquire a momentum which is proportional to the cavity momentum and the pump momentum. In the following, I'm going to consider the fact that Kc is roughly equal to Kp. And so basically, the, these, these, photons are scat these uh, atoms are scattered by the photons uh, from, a state, from a ground state to a state which has a diagonal momentum as it is represented here. OK. Now, I outlined you the phenomenology of the cavity. Now, let's go to the theory, basically. So you see the phenomenology is pretty complicated. There are a lot of cavity mode functions, uh, pump mode functions, a lot of little details, the local interaction. But from the theory perspective, things are pretty simple, at least as long we are in a dispersive cavity. And this is the definition of a dispersive cavity. It means that the 
K square, so which is this is called the recoil momentum, uh, the recoil energy, sorry, the recoil frequency, which is proper, which means it's basically the energy that is imprinted of the atom by the scattering, by the scattering process. This energy is much smaller than the cavity line width. So the cavity line width is, you see by this simple picture, each cav the cavity is never perfect. No, the mirror cannot be perfect. They, know, they never reflect 100% of the light. They always uh, reflect only a portion of the light and there is a small portion that gets lost. This is the scale, this is the, this, the finesse of the cavity, the, how much the cavity dissipates and loses light. As long as this coupling is much larger than, than the momentum of, that the atoms acquire, we can basically say that the cavity is fast with respect to the atom. It means that the, the cavity dynamics, uh, so the dynamics for which a photon goes into the cavity, bounces forth and back, and then it's lost, uh, it's much faster than the atom's dynamic. Now, this is just a time scale reasonment. Photons do their job very fast. They enter the cavity, they are scattered, they bounce forth and back, and then they are lost at a very high rate. A rate which is much faster than the rate at which the atoms evolve, because the atoms are slow. They have a slow momentum, a small momentum. Within this assumption, it makes sense to eliminate the cavity. Eliminate the cavity means we integrate over the cavity mode, because the two time scales are very different. I would say, so as you are master students, I would say this is very similar in some sense of what you have, I think you have seen in your basic courses when we talk about the Oppenheimer approximations for an atom. No, you normally consider the motion of the electron into the static field of the nucleus of the ion, because the nucleus is very slow with respect to the electrons. And this is kind of the same thing, no? The atoms are small with respect to the photons that are fast. And so we can integrate away the photons and the photons generate an interaction potential between the atoms. And this is what happens. So we can integrate away the atomic part of the wave function and we get a effective Hamiltonian for the atoms alone in which interactions between the atoms are mediated by the photons. And as I said in my analogy with the Oppenheimer approximation, it's like when you take, you integrate away electrons from an atom and you only consider, or from a crystal, and you only consider the motion of the ions of the, of the nuclei into the effective potential generated by the electrons. Very good. So this is Basically, what happens in this case is not a potential that's generated by the integration procedure. It's a interaction term in the sense that the photon interacts, uh, in, the photon mediates interaction between the atoms. And this interaction potential is long range. It's given by a convolution, as you see, of basically the cavity mode and the uh, pump mode. I am not going to give you the details how this is done. What is important is this is, you see, it's a checkboard potential in two dimensions. So if this, if this is a two dimensional cavity, as it often happens, this basically generates an interaction potential, which is a cosine. It's very similar to the one that you have, uh, that you have already encountered in the Hamiltonian mean field model. And indeed, this is really what happens. So this system can be mapped into the Hamiltonian mean field model. And in order to do this, one has to define a theta, which is a, a order parameter, which is basically the sum of the cosines of kxj. So k is the momentum of the cavity, no? The photon in the cavity has a certain momentum, and this is the momentum of the photon of, in the cavity, but it's also the momentum that get imprinted to the atoms by the scattering process. So K is just one over the cavity length. So it's, it does something like this. And XJ are the position of each atom in the cavity. 
So you see basically that when this guy is maximum or minimum, it means that all cosines are plus one or minus one. It means that the atoms are occupying the maxima of this standing wave. So there is a standing wave in the cavity. This standing wave has a momentum K. If the, max, if the atom occupies either the maxima or the minima of the standing wave, you get a theta which is either plus one or minus one. So this, uh, this order parameter theta, it's finite and large, well, large in the sense that it tends to one, when there is a spatial order in the cavity where the atoms occupy the, these uh, special points on the cavity standing wave. If the atoms are disordered, so they occupy random places and they are like, they behave like a quantum gas at low temperature, so they are basically a non-homogeneous condensate, this theta is zero. And as a function of the cavity of the pump uh, field, so changing the pump field, when the cavity, when the intensity of the light of this pump light is small, is smaller than value. Are there any questions, Stefano? No, no, I don't think uh, maybe it was background noise. Okay, sorry. So it's always present in cavity, so don't worry. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, in this case, it was not fast enough that we didn't hear it. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So what I was saying is that basically the uh, so basically when the when the intensity of the pump field is low is be, is below at some critical threshold, it's like if the cavity weren't there. Basically, the atoms are in a bosa, in a condensate. They live in a in a homogeneous state, mostly with zero momentum, and there is just some small. Uh, some small light intensity that impact on the atoms, uh, the intensity get immediately lost very fast because K is anyway somehow large. Uh, the intensity gets immediately lost from the cavity. And so the, the, the pump just uh, acts as a little bit of a small temperature effect on the atom cloud. On the other end, when omega grows above a certain threshold, omega C, then above the threshold, it's when the situation becomes interesting because there is enough light scattered by the pump into the cavity that one generates a standing wave, okay? So basically for small intensity, there is no standing wave field in the cavity and the, there is no radiation detectable in the cavity, only very small fluctuations. But when the pump, uh, overcomes this threshold, a standing wave is generated. This standing wave is the result somehow of the scattering of the atoms of photon from the pump to the cavity. You see, this is the photon that goes, it bounces towards an atom and it's reflected. And it's, yes, it's scattered into the cavity. And these photons that get scattered into the cavity are so many that basically the cavity starts to have a standing wave uh, field inside it. So when you now want to measure the number of photons in the cavity, you will find that the number of photons in the cavity is finite. It means that there is a finite light intensity inside the cavity. But this light intensity as a standing wave mode function, as we said, so it's it's a cosine or a sine. And the atoms react to this, to this electromagnetic field and they want to occupy either the maxima or the minima. And so they basically arrange themselves in order to be in these positions and they made a structural transition. This structural transition means that they uh, arrange themselves into, into basically a lattice. And once they arrange themselves, they also foster the scattering. So it, when they are structurally arranged, it's easier for them to scatter photons. And so there is a feedback mechanism for which basically this becomes a laser in the sense that there is some light 
that comes out from the cavity, which has a certain fixed intensity, which is proportional to the intensity that you get inside the cavity. Obviously, I call this a laser, but there is no, so, well, it's a form of laser because this is a coherent light. There is a structure, so there is a coherent light that goes out, but obviously it's, it's not an efficient one because the, the pump intensity is very high. So we, it's just an interesting phenomenon from the theoretical point of view because it's a quantum phase transition. Well, yeah, it's a phase transition or on the quantum nature we can, we can discuss about. It's a phase transition and this phase transition is uh, somehow the can be mapped, can be related to the phase transition that you have seen in the Hamiltonian mean field model. Because when you, when you go and you boil down this system to the very minimal ingredients, the very minimal ingredients are that the, there is a motion from the atom, which is this P square, and there is an interaction from the atom. The interaction from the atom, it's all to all, so it's an all to all interaction and can be represented by this theta to the square, which is the order parameter to the square. And when you take the order parameter to the square and you rearrange the terms, you see that it looks like this. And this is exactly this cos k xi minus xj is exactly the same that appears into the, into the Hamiltonian Biffle model that you know of, which is here. There is also the cut scaling, which is automatically implemented because this is like a standard results in cavity system. The intensity of the light in the cavity decreases like one over the size of the cavity itself. So basically the fact that the interaction is mediated by light, it's automatically realizes cut scaling in this, in this system. So you see, you see the two systems, so the system of atoms trapped into an optical cavity after integration over the cavity mode, it looks really, really resembles the Hamiltonian of the Hamiltonian of the Hamiltonian mean field model. It has a cut scaling, it has global interaction, and it has a second order phase transition. And the second order phase transition is basically the same. It's in the same universality class. The difference between these two systems is that in the cavity, there is also a breaking of uh, translational invariance, which is not uh, existent in the Hamiltonian mean field model. So there is this cosine of Xi plus Xj term, which leads to the breaking of translational invariance. But anyway, this is not relevant in the phase, in the, in the phase where there is structural order and it's not even relevant at the transition point. So somehow the physics of the two models is very close to each other apart from this term and apart of course, from the fact that this is a driven dissipative system. So in this system, there is noise. There is, uh, yes, there is noise. There is an effect of dissipation, which is this K, which nothing of which is, repre is represented by the simplified Hamiltonian. But anyway, the overall physics, the qualitative physics is the same. And this justify us, as I mean, theoreticians like me that work in the quantum field to focus on the study of fully connected spin system. Because this fully connected spin system represent well the overall qualitative feature of this transition, which appears in cavity and also somehow of some ferromagnetic transition that can be simulated, that has be, have been simulated with trapped ions. Okay, here I go finally to the theory. So I think I talked long enough about the experiments. It was just meant to give you a glimpse of what we can do with these experiments. Are there questions on the experimental part? May, sorry, um, maybe I missed some point, but where do you see that there is a long range interaction in, in the Hamiltonians that you showed us? Okay, basically the long range interaction is seen here. So, okay, this is not represented very well, but let me try to, uh, let me try. So first of all, let me do a 
qualitative argument and then let me try to give you some, some formula, even if not precise. So the qualitative argument is the same, is the, is the following. We said that the atoms want to have this structural transition. They want to occupy the minima or the maxima of this standing wave field uh, in the cavity. No, do you agree with me that this is a fact? In the sense, atoms always want to be either, on, depending on the depending on some details of the atoms, they, they always want to provide either either the maxima or the minima of the of an electromagnetic field. Yes. So this is this is the fact. So now this this electromagnetic field in the cavity is only there due to the fact that the atoms scatter the light. Okay. So in some sense, the existence of the field in the cavity depends from the fact that the, that the atoms are efficient, that the, the spatial distribution of the atoms, uh, it's efficient in scattering the light. So basically, it means uh, that if I move one of the atoms outside of their favorite position, it will be less efficient uh, to scatter the light. Uh, and the light intensity has to decrease a bit. So this is something that the system doesn't want to happen because it's minimum, it's, it's equilibrium is, well, it's not equilibrium because it's driven really but if it's, uh, uh, it's stable configuration, it's when the atoms occupy the minima or the maxima of this grid. And so if the atoms moves a little bit out, it gets pushed back by the, by the field of the cavity. You know? It goes back into its, it has some, some force that confines it into a certain place. But this force, but, but, sorry, I, see, I hear some noise, some strange noise. Mm. Do you hear it? Yes, yes, yeah, I can hear you. It's just some background uh, no, noise. Okay. In the, I don't see okay, okay. Now it's anyone uh, who, they are all muted, uh, those, in, uh, apart from you. So, okay, very good. And very me, good. so I can fine. eliminate maybe the, my, my mind. So basically, the atom feel the restoring force mediated by the cavity light. But the intensity of the cavity light, it's proportional to the number of atoms. Because the more atoms are in the cavity, the more scattering there is. So there is a, there is a proportionality coefficient between the light in the cavity and the number of atoms. So it means that the light mediates an interaction between atoms. Because the intensity of the light itself uh, is proportional to the number of atoms. But the force uh, that the atom feel to be, that brings them to their position, it's also caused by the cavity light. So you see how the photon mediate interaction between the atoms. Uh, do you agree with me on this? Yes, yes, I agree with you, but- Perfect. Now okay. let's go, why is it long range? It is long range because the cavity is a standing wave single mode cavity. So as we say, the intensity of the light, is just proportional to the number of atoms. It does not depend on their position, on their distance, on their distribution. It just globally depends on how many they are and if they are in the minima or if they are scattered. So basically it means that if I move an atom here, it feels a force that brings it back, which is proportional to the number of atoms. It's not proportional to the distance. And this you see from the fact that my theta, my order parameter, is just a sum over cosines, no? There is no distance between the atoms. This, this theta is proportional to the position. So this, is, this theta is the result of the sum over the position of the atoms with respect to the cavity standing, to the cavity wave. Now in the Hamiltonian that I haven't derived for you, but in the Hamiltonian here, there is theta to the square. And you see that this theta to the square, it, 
it's an interaction between the atoms because it basically couples the position between the atoms, but it couples them all to all. It doesn't couple them proportionally to the distance or anything. It's just each atom feels the force of the cavity, but the force of the cavity is proportional to the entire density of all the other atoms. Was this clear, at least intuitively? Yes, thank you. Now it's much clearer with the uh, theta square. Thank you. Very good. And then if you if you go into the review that I told you, so this one, this archive, there are the details on how to go from this, basically, actually from this to this. And you can try and you can really see that in the end you get this cosine of the distance. But the cosine of the distance is just the result that these are the cosine of the position. When you do cosine of the square, you can do the prostaferesi formula, you get the cosine of the distance. But there are some intermediate steps, so one should be careful. I don't want to bore you with the details. The important point is that you get the overall picture. Everything is proportional to the density, not to the density, to the number of atoms. Very good. Someone else? No, I don't see questions, so you can go on. Uh... Very good. So let's go to some theory. And the theory is, so in a sense, that, that before was the theory of the experiment. I and mean, if somebody of you has ever worked with experiment, the theory of the experiment is easier than the theory of the theory. Because in, and not because we are lazy theoreticians, but because in theory, we want to have a model which is simple enough that we can really understand the basic phenomena. No? We, can, we want to understand the fundamental ingredients that lead to a certain phenomena. We don't want to have to be bothered by all the tiny details like the, the breaking of that symmetry or the, the, the small dissipation, which is not, not relevant, but it makes some contribution. We want to focus on the necessary ingredient to study a certain phenomenon. And the phenomenon that we have in mind here is this, the, the transition, the structural transition between disordered both Einstein condensate in a cavity and um, disordered both Einstein condensate in a cavity and structurally ordered atoms in the lattice with a standing wave light within them. This transition is really oh, sorry. This transition is related to the Hamiltonian mean field model for the reason that we have discussed before. And since it is related to the Hamiltonian mean field model, let's focus on something which is somehow even simpler, just a simple long range spin chain, which has a quantum phase transition between a ferromagnetic and a paramagnetic state. And the ferromagnetic state, uh, and so, and, uh, so I focus on this Hamiltonian where you have global all to all interaction. You see, this is to the square. This is just the magnetization along the Z direction. The interactions are ferromagnetic. It means that J is larger than zero. And we have the usual cut scaling to ensure that the energy is, is extensive. And these atoms, these, these spins, these are one half spin operators. So you see here, there are the Pauli matrices divided by one half. This is not so important. These are one half spin operators and they feel an external magnetic field, which however act on the X component of the spin rather than on the longitudinal component. This is what is called a, a transverse fieldizing model. Have you ever encountered this kind of system? Is there anybody that doesn't know anything about the transverse fieldizing model? Okay, apparently everybody kind of knows it. Very good. So this is nothing but a transverse fieldizing model, as I said, where interactions are global. So each spin in the model interacts with, a, with each other spin. And we can, in close analogy with what you have already done for classical system, 
try to compute the partition function of the model by doing the trace of E minus beta H. So H is the Hamiltonian, beta is the inverse temperature. This is the Boltzmann weight. The only difference is now, instead of integrating over all classical state, we have to make a trace over all quantum states. But I think it's kind of the same. The interesting part is that since this system is global interacting, it can be basically mapped into a single giant spin. And we do this by defining the total magnetization operator, which has are this MZ, MY, and MX. And when, they, when we define them in this way, you immediately see that the, I'm sorry, here there is a mistake. Now it should be correct. So you see now, this is basically, the Hamiltonian is, first of all, in this way, it's explicit that it's extensive, no? Because I have this overall N factor where N is the total number of speed. But also you see that I mapped my Hamiltonian into a single giant spin, which is self-interacting, no? A giant spin into a magnetic field. But this giant spin now is, as I say, is the result of the sum of many, a large number n of one half spins. And so by the usual formula of the addition between spin states, you have that the spins can have a very large, um, a very large uh, total, um, a, a very large spin modulus, so S square and also have different magnetization state. It is, it, is, it is important to note that this Hamiltonian commutes with the modules of the spin. So each sector, each spin, each total spin sector behaves on its own in the sense that if I, um, if I initialize my system, if I, I want to study the dynamic of my system, and I initialize it in a certain spin state, this spin, so this modulus will be conserved. The modulus of that spin, spin state will be conserved by the dynamic. Now, this is the standard. You know this from basic quantum mechanics. When the Hamiltonian commute with some operator, that operator is conserved. That, yeah. That operator is conserved. So this is basically what happens to the total spin. And I wanted just to remember for to you that when you have a large spin, we basically use normally a basis of two quantum numbers, which are the total modules of the spin and the, the polarization along the z directions. And so this I wanted just to remind to you. Okay, very good. Now we want to solve this. Uh, we want to calculate this partition function. And so we say that you, uh, Sorry, is... Nicolò, did you study the angular momentum in, uh, in uh, the course of quantum mechanics? I okay, so. so these formulas are not uh, <laughs> odd to you. So you, you know uh, that, okay. Anyway, okay it's uh, just a different view. You, you can imagine uh, of having, a, as a, uh, Nicolò is saying, a sort of giant spin, okay made of all the spins of all the, the parts. Sorry, Nicola, I wanted to check. Uh... Yeah, yeah, I, the fact is that I don't see the faces of the people. So it's good if sometimes you, you tell me what's, what's, what's going on. So uh, what I want, so basically what Stefano was saying, this is just, if you study the angular momentum rules, this is just the rules of angular momentum. Oh yeah, so you have a Z, you have a preferential component that we always call Z you have an eigenvalue along that component, and then there is another eigenvalue, which is important to characterize the state, which is the modulus, the total modulus square, which is S. So these are the standard two eigenvalue for uh, angular momentum states in quantum mechanics. In some sense, they are not crucial for what follows, but if you know them, it's better. So now we want to compute this, uh, this e to the minus beta, so this partition function, we want to compute it 
But we are faced with the fact that, yes, it is a single giant spin, so it seems a pretty simple system, but still in the Hamiltonian, there are two operators they do not, that do not commute with each other. So mx does not commute with mz, and it doesn't even commute with mz squared. Okay. So these two operators do not commute, and since they do not commute, it's not so easy to calculate the trace over all possible states, because the states are many. Because remember, this is a giant spin. It has many values of s and has values, many values of mz. So basically, mz goes from minus n half and n half, and s can. So there are a very large number of states which you have to sum over. So it's better to make a trick. And the trick you want to make is to use what is called the Suzuki Trotter transformation. And this trick is very well known in quantum mechanics, even if you maybe don't know it. And it's a trick to map a quantum system into a classical one. And this is why I wanted to do it, this for you, to you, not in all details. You can check all details in this reference, for example, or in reference therein. If you are interested, we can discuss what is the best reference to study this kind of structure decomposition. But I believe this long range interacting system is one, a very good example of how this trotter decomposition is applied. So first of all, the trotter, uh, the Suzuki trotter transformation is based on the simple equivalence that is shown here. So that the exponential of a sum of operators, so remember that these are operators, I didn't put the hat to, to keep it light, but it's, they are all operators. So if you do not commute, if they do not commute, as you know, you cannot use the, you cannot decompose it in the product of two exponential. But you can do that if you use this formula. So is it true that the exponential of the sum is equal to the product of the exponential as long as this product is done in many slices, you see? So basically you divide each operator by ns and then you rise it the wall to ns. So you repeat this ns time. And when you send ns to infinity, these two guys are equal. So can you see the difference? Is there anybody that doesn't see the difference between these two? Okay, so you see it. There is a sharp difference. This is the exponential of the sum this is the product of the exponentials, but I have to repeat this product an infinite now. I have to reapply this product an infinite number of times. So this ns, it means I'm reapplying and reapplying before this product is equal to the actual exponential. Okay. So if you bought this formula, let's just apply it to the big to the calculation we want to do. So to the trace, to the partition function of the giant spin Hamiltonian. And so instead of calculating the entire exponential, I do the product of the exponentials, but I have to repeat it ns times, you know? And in each of these ns terms in the, pro so yes, for each term in this product of exponential, I put a, uh, identity operator, no? I put the sum over all possible states. Remember that the spin, the coherent spin states are a complete basis. So I have a complete basis for my system. I just insert the identity as the projection over all the states in the complete basis. And I introduce this identity between each of these Expo NS exponential products. And I get this little bit of a messy formula. Let's try to decompose it. So these are the two exponential operators that have been separated and they are sandwiched between two states. And these states are just a spin configuration. So, so these are a configuration of microscopic spins. So the, these states basically tell you the each of the um, 
So they are just the states in which each of the spin is polarized along Z plus or minus one, no? It's just a classical state of the spin. This, uh, this kind of term is reproduced n s time. No, this is the product n s times of these same terms, with the difference that each basis. So each basis is a different one because I added the, the identity n s times. So these are n s terms in the product. Each one uh, is done as this uh, as this form, and when you put two of them close to each other, there is sigma alpha plus one, sigma alpha plus one in here, and this is the identity. And you can remove it, and you can get back to the original form. Very good. Okay, this doesn't seem like we have done much progress. So now we have instead of our exponential of the sum, we have two exponentials, but we have this product over all the trotter slices. So each of this term in the product is called the trotter slice. And we have also to sum over all possible states in each in the trotter slice. The only interesting thing is that now we can put this operator outside the brackets because this MZ we know it basically these states are eigenstates of MZ. So there is no tunneling induced between different states by MZ and this can be put outside. And we only have to calculate the tunneling induced by MX between different spin classical spin configurations. Okay, this in principle is doable, but we can do something even easier and better because this MZ term is squared and it's a little bit annoying because it couples all the spins in the system. No, this is the reason why we say that this is a global spin. In the sense, we need to consider it as a global spin to solve it. It would be somehow better if we could remove this square here and in such a, in such a way that we can only act on a single site and the Hamiltonian will be uh, basically at the Hamiltonian of a non-interacting system. The interesting thing is that we can do that in this system and we can do that by making a simple trick. And the trick is based on the fact that this, is, this guy here, it's not anymore an operator. Even if it's, an oper it's not anymore an operator because it is diagonal in the state in this state here. Now this state, as I told you, our classical state polarized along an SZ. So this guy now it's a classical number. I can take it out. I didn't put the formula, but you can imagine it. I just take it out. And since I can take it out, I can now do a trick, which is to use a delta potential, which fixes my order parameter. So this is why these kind of systems are called mean field models. Because we can define with what I call them alpha, which is nothing but the sum over the classical values of SZ. No, as I say, the sum over of the SZs of each site, these are now classical values, because as I told you, these states were the classical states. And for each of the trotter slices, we define a different order parameter. And how we define this order parameter, we just put a delta function of m minus this summation into this um, equation. We put this delta function, which fixes the summation to m alpha. And when we use the representation of the delta function as an exponential, we get to this guy here. You see, I haven't done much. It's maybe a bit of passages that you can redo yourself at home if you're interested. If you have an intuition for what's happening, even better. The intuition is simple. I use the Suzuki trotter to decompose the exponential. 
I took this guy outside because this guy, it's classical, it's not an operator because the basis I chose, it's a basis of the eigenvalues of MZ. So this guy has classical values in this basis. Now I use the trick of a delta function to somehow define, to, to make my integral in such a way that the integral, that each of the integrals over, um, that each of the integral over the state, over the spin states, it occurs at a fixed values of M alpha. That's the point, no? The point is that this Hamiltonian, now the only part that depends on the, on the sides being coupled is this part here. But this part here I can take care of with a constraint that constrains some classical value to be the sum of the longitudinal. There is a the question, uh, Nicolò, from, uh, from please, the audience. Please, please, tell me. Uh, I have a question uh, on the previous slide where we compute the trace. Why mm -hmm. are the eigenstates different sigma of alpha and then sigma of alpha plus one on the right-hand side, on the right side? Mm -hmm. So okay, can you repeat the question? Sorry, my uh, phone We were computing the trace for the partition function, but why we are uh, doing the product of sigma of alpha on the left side and sigma of alpha plus one on the right side? You saw because basically, remember, look at the Suzuki tractor decomposition. No? You have this guy, which is the same as this guy, repeated n s times, no? When I put it to the power, I mean, no, that I, I repeat, it's a product of all the same guy n s times, okay? Now, in here, I can put it just as a power. In here, I do not have any power because in between of each terms of this product, I have inserted a complete basis. Let me, maybe I can do something. Uh, maybe I can do something. Maybe he does not understand why it is labeled yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I, 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 plus one. A simply a complete base in several I, I points. Understand it's a way of numbering a complete base uh, in several, you, several slices. Can you, do you mind if I, if I, I will try to do something? Let's see if this works. Okay. You see my screen, no? No. Uh, no. Okay, that's the problem. Sorry, guys. Okay, now you see it. Correct? Yes, yes. Okay, let me. Sorry, I'm not the best at doing this, I understand that. Okay, so finally, I think I did it. So now you see, imagine that you have these two operators. <coughs> I'm trying to simplify the things, no? So this is a a1, a a2 to the square. So this means that this is a a1, a a2 multiplied by a a1, a a2. Okay, so this is a product between the two. Now I insert in here 
I insert the identity. And the identity is the sum over all states. So this sigma bar means over all possible configuration of the spins. Do you agree with me with, on this equation? Do you understand it? Uh, sorry, who is the guy that made the question? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. It's okay, no? So you see, this is the identity. Now I insert the identity inside here. I insert the identity inside there. I insert the identity inside there and I get that there is the sum over sigma of a a1 a a2 sigma sigma a a1 a a2 but now remember that I have to compute the trace of this guy. So I have to put another sandwich on the other side. So this is the sum over sigma bar, sigma prime bar, sigma prime, A, A1, A, A2, sigma, 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 A, A1, A, a2 sigma prime. You see it now. So this is sigma prime. This is sigma. Sorry. So this is sigma prime. This is sigma. And this is sigma prime. Okay. So basically, if we go back to, and unfortunately, this, I, I cannot share the two screen at the same time. But if we go back, to what I was showing before. This is sigma and this is sigma prime. And this product means that there is another guy coming which has the same shape, but on the left it has sigma prime and on the right it has sigma second. Then there is sigma second, again, sigma third. You see, it's the same calculation that I have done you on the blackboard or on the whiteboard, but ns times. I've done it only two. Now this is ns times. Do you see it? Yes, thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so it's not a, it's not an easy calculation. This one of the trotter decomposition. It needs some care, so you can redo it at all. But the important thing is you understand for each factor, for each factor in this infinite product of the trotter decomposition, I need to introduce an identity. And then basically this is where it comes from, the fact that on the left you have a sigma alpha, then you have a sigma alpha plus one, then there is another guy, sigma alpha plus two, sigma alpha plus three, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so this, having done this, now I was going to another trick, which is very common in field theory, quantum field theory, statistical physics, etc., which is the one to restrict an integral via delta function. And this is exactly what's happening here, no? I want to use a delta function, which I represent as an exponential of E i lambda, to make it in such a way that the values of m alpha, which I have here, which is also here, is the sum over all S Z. And so basically it, it means uh, somehow that I can simplify, well, not simplify, but I can, I can rewrite this integral over all possible configurations, which was a little bit annoying to be done explicitly. This summation over all possible configuration now becomes an integral over all possible values of M alpha and an integral 
over d lambda alpha, and d lambda alpha is not in lambda alpha is nothing but the Lagrange multiplier that fixes m alpha to be equal to sigma z. And indeed, you see that lambda alpha, of course, here in front of m alpha, and here in front of sigma z, because it tells you that this, this identity when doing the integration has to be fulfilled. Very good. Uh, so basically, I, thanks to using the properties of the delta function, I have rewritten the integration in such a way that this is an integral over the value of the magnetization, where the value of, magnet, of the magnetization is fixed to be what I want, so to be its definition by a Lagrange multiplier alpha. And I have also to integrate over the Lagrange multiplier alpha because this is the property of the delta function. Uh, but now, the, what I gained, what I gained is that the quadratic guy is written in terms of the classical parameter m alpha, and the, the the term which is lambda alpha sigma z alpha, I can put it back into the trace, and now it is a single side term. And now I have to do the trace here only over a single side operator. Okay, this is a bit complicated, I understand. So I do not pretend that you grasp all of what I'm saying. You should just see the main point. The main point is that, well, the Suzuki Trotter recomposition, I guess we discussed it in details. The main point is that in this representation, this guy is a classical value, so I can take it out but I'm still a little bit bothered by the fact that the summation is over all possible configuration of an infinite giant spin. So I need to compute the, the configuration. It's possible, but it's a bit annoying that I have to compute uh, the multiplicity of each configuration that gives the same magnetization. Instead of doing it explicitly, I can use a Lagrange multiplier to impose it and so introduce this delta function into the integral and simplify my integral in such a way that it's an integral over two parameters, all the values of the magnetization and the values of this somehow Lagrange multiplier that fix this to be what I expect it to be. And when I do this trick, I replace my integration over all the spin configuration into an integration over two variables and I need to compute only the trace of this operator that is back to be the Hamiltonian. But this operator is now easy to compute because it's a single side operator. Very well. I have hopefully uh, given at least a glimpse of what's happening. And now we come to the most important part. The most important part is that all of this transformation that I have done I've always left n the sides of the system out. You see, this is the crucial part. The crucial part is that there is always an n that lives in front of the exponential. And since there is an n that lives in front of the exponential, it means that in the thermodynamic limit, I do not need to make this integration at all. Okay, so I have done a lot of work to simplify this integral, but actually I never need to do it. Because as I go to the thermodynamic limit, it will be only the minimum or the extremum of this guy that contributes. Only the extremum. This is a standard property, a mathematical property, you know, that the exponent the integral over the exponential of something which is decreasing exponentially fast only receives contribution from the minimum of the exponent. Well, I guess this, you know. And so basically when I approach the thermodynamic limit, I don't need to make an integral. I, it's enough that I minimize the quantity which is near. And to minimize the quantity, it means basically that the, the free energy, so this is the integral to be done as the partition function. When I take the log of the partition function, I get only this minimum, no? Only the minimum of this guy. 
So the log of the partition function is the free energy. The free energy is just the extremization with respect to lambda and the minimization with respect to m of this guy here. And this guy here, when you do the trace over the single side, is this one. Okay. I'm skipping a bit of passages. As I said, I, it will be very boring to do the entire computation. So I leave it for you to do at home. I'm trying just to give you a glimpse of what is the physics behind. The physics behind is that this system is a giant spin with global interaction. And the global interaction are such that in the thermodynamic limit, the, the integral for the partition function, it receives contribution only from the saddle point. And this is a very important part. The very important part is that the integral receives contribution only from the saddle point. And this is the typical thing that happens in long range interacting quantum system where there are strong long range interactions, possibly like in this case, flat fully connected interactions. You see, it won't be the same if this were a nearest neighbor coupling. If this were a nearest neighbor coupling, there would be no N here, and this term will, be, will couple only nearest neighbor sides. So there could be no possible trick of defining a global classical parameter. And there, especially, there could be no possibility to take the saddle point as the result of the integral, because there will be no N factor in here. So this is very important in some sense. Thanks to the mean field uh, nature of the, of the interactions, we can trade our integration with the saddle point. The saddle point is very easily done. You just take the derivative with respect to lambda and m and you post them to zero. And you immediately find that lambda is equal to 2jm and that m is equal to this. And since lambda is, pro, is it's lambda itself, it's m, you see that this is a mean field condition. No, it ties m with itself. I guess you have also seen this condition, well, maybe not in this form, but if you, pre if you put h, the external magnetic field to zero, this is just the mean field condition of the classicalizing model that I think you know. No, If you put h to zero, these two lambda simplify each other. And this is this, that m is the, the hyperbolic tangent of beta to jm, which is exactly what you get from the mean field treatment of the classicalizing model. And here we found it in its quantum generalization, where there is also the H, the external magnetic field that plays a role. Uh, and in this, kind, in this kind of system, this treatment is exact because this saddle point that you do here, it's exact. So this is an exercise for you. Take the transverse fieldizing model with nearest neighbor interaction, the one that you know, the, the, the standard case, try to do the mean field approximation and check that you will get basically the same result with some coefficients which are different. So since this is the mean field equation that we all know, it's not surprising that there is a phase transition, a second order phase transition, which is basically shown here. So as a function of the magnetization Z, sorry, here I didn't put the MZ, but this is obviously MZ. Uh, MZ as a function of J for different temperatures, H has been fixed to one. So I fix H to one. And for two temperatures, I give you the magnetization as a function of J. And not surprisingly, the larger is the temperature, the stronger you need J to make the system magnetize and you can easily compute the phase diagram. So the critical temperature as a function of J, as usual, this is J over H and this is TC over H. So H has been set to one. And if you do the computation, you can do it easily. You see that this is the shape of the critical temperature as a function of J. And basically you see that the system is paramagnetic for T 
above this line and is ferromagnetic for T below this line. And you see another very important aspect of quantum phase transition, which is the, I believe this is the most studied case of quantum phase transition. The quantum phase transition occurs at the end of a line of classical phase transition. So when you cross this line, you have a finite temperature phase transition that in critical phenomena, it's always called a classical phase transition. So even if the system is quantum in itself, when you, when you cross this line, it behaves as, it as if it were a classical system. And so we always call this a line of classical phase transition, but as the temperature is reduced, the line ends up on this point and here there is a quantum critical point which occurs as a function of J at fixed H, okay? So remember, line of classical phase transition which terminates into a quantum critical point. And this is the standard, the most known case of critical phenomena in quantum system. Do you know this, uh, this concept of quantum critical phenomena in quantum system so that the quantum critical point may occur at the end of a line of classical transitions? Is there somebody that doesn't know that? Everybody, I think. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, so. Very no, but good. I think it's a very good illustration on a simple in this example. Case, Exactly. In the, the cool thing is that in most of the book that you may find and study, this diagram will be either obtained by intuitive arguments or by some kind of approximation. In this model that we have here, it is an exact result. And it is an exact result because in this model, the sides of the system N act as a control parameter. In basically, as you increase the size of the system N, the partition function only receives contribution from the saddle, from, from the saddle point. And this, it amounts to say that the system is exactly solved by its mean field approximation. So while in most of the system, the mean field approximation is just an approximation that has to be obtained with either intuitive or formal arguments, but it's still an approximation. In this case, the mean field approximation emerges naturally from the computation. And it emerges naturally, I want to say it just once again, because N, the size of the system, appears in front of the exponential and it acts as a control parameter. Okay. And so basically, in this system of fully connected spins, we see that the phase diagram is exactly what you expect, a line of thermal phase transition which terminates in a quantum critical point. And this is the same that you will find on Wikipedia. This is the plot that you find on Wikipedia or on the book of such but quantum, such that quantum phase transition, which is exactly the same situation, no? a quantum critical point, which, is, which occurs at the termination of a line of uh, classical phase transition. The only point that you have to remember in here is that while in the standard case of nearest neighbor or local system, one has a boundary. So one has a region where there are strong fluctuations. And so basically there is a region where classical statistical fluctuations are very strong and they give, and they make it very difficult to treat the system with mean field or any approximate technique. In our case of strongly of long range system, this does not happen in the thermodynamic limit because in our case, fluctuations are cut off by N. And so when we approach the thermodynamic limit, this region becomes thinner and thinner until it vanishes. So this is why I wanted to share the comparison between this and this, which are exactly the same plot with the difference that this shaded region here, it doesn't exist for us because there is no strong fluctuation regime in the thermodynamic limit. Okay, I think I had some other thing to show you, but we have gone a little bit slower, oh, which is good. Yeah, I think that uh, it is enough, uh, uh, Nicolò, because uh, the last step uh, to, to do the log of the trace of, uh, of uh, sigma x, uh, now we'll take them uh, some time, I think, exactly, to, exactly. to, to so do it. 
So they have uh, to uh, explicit uh, the, the calculation of the log of the trace of... Uh, of uh, Absolutely. Okay. And you can write me if any one of you has problems or questions. That this is the reference you should look for. And in this reference, there are all the references that are... This, I, it's the, the first part of the reference is basically a review, so it's quite pedagogical, but it contains a lot of textbook and all the reference inside, so you can really use it. Uh, this is this reference here. And they don't have your email, so if you can put uh, in the chat... No, uh, maybe I can write it on the blackboard. As you wish. Yes, okay. So you could add, uh, you could add uh, Nicolò on Slack. Ah, yes, I can, I have, I can also enter in Slack. Oh, I don't have Slack on this computer. But you exchanged, I, I think, Matteo an email, so. Are there any questions to, on the part I've said? Questions? I don't see in the chat. This is the analogous, I would say, of the Curie Weiss model, but made it quantum with an external field. Okay? So uh, it would be completely classical if H were zero. So then, if H is zero, the model is, is in fact the Curie Weiss classical model. Okay? But the simple addition of H, because H adds an operator which does not commute with sigma Z, makes the transition quantum. But only at, at, zero but only at t equals zero. Only at t equals zero. So, uh, so there is no classical phase transition in H, you know. Because uh, if I add an H in the Curie Weiss, I remove the phase transition. Classically. No, because if I add an H in the Curie Weiss, instead of having a singularity in the magnetization, I have a smooth behavior uh, of, the, uh, of the magnetization. Sorry, okay. Stefano, just to clarify, the, the difference is that what Stefano is saying, it will be ex exactly the same in the quantum case if you were adding a longitudinal A longitudinal, yes, yeah, sigma so Z. An H Z that multiplies an M Z or a sigma Z. Okay. But since this is transverse, so this is basically the quantum nature of the system, you see from the fact that the interaction and the magnetic field, they act on two different components of the magnetization that you don't have in the classical case, because in the classical case, the spin is just a, an arrow. It doesn't have components. It goes just up or down. Is it clear? OK. I think it's a very nice example of a, of a model that is uh, solvable. And uh, uh, nevertheless, it's, uh, it, con uh, it contains uh, its reach in that it contains this uh, concept of uh, phase transition in an Hamiltonian which is made of two non-commuting uh, uh, operators. So let's My thank... Yes? Sorry, Stefano, go on, go on. No, no, no. Uh... No, I wanted to say my suggestion to really understand this a little bit of intricacies is to try to take the Hamiltonian, that is this one, or this one, as you prefer, and study it either via this technique that I have shown, that you find it in the reference, or by just doing the mean field as you are used to be. No, you, you can do it just in mean field, just taking that the operator is just a classical values plus a small perturbation. And you will see that you find the exactly same result. But the mean field tricks is kind of arbitrary, no? Because you make a decoupling that 
we know it's a little bit of arbitrary. While with this way, you really see that for the long range interacting system, the fluctuations contribution to the partition function, it's suppressed by n. And then as Stefano said, you're right, I didn't show you in details how to do this trace, but this is just a trace on an operator over a single site, so it's easy to do. It's just, you have to diagon diagonalize a two by two Hamiltonian basically. And indeed you get a hyperbolic cosine. But you will see it when you do it, and if you have a problem, you can write me and we can discuss, but this is a very simple part. The crucial part is to understand this N, how this N comes out. So, okay. So tomorrow is at uh, two fifteen uh, your lecture, Nicolò. Two fifteen. So eight eight fifteen for me. Yes. So it will be with coffee in Boston. <laughs> well, uh, there is. It's even difficult to go to the bar here, so you have to do coffee at home because there is snow everywhere. <laughs> okay. So and there is snow in Boston, so it's very cold. I think no. Super cold. It's <laughs> minus four, minus five, but it's also okay. very humid. So you feel it. I feel it much more here than in Zurich. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, guys. Are you sure you don't have any questions? Sure. Okay. Uh, I see that where everybody wants to leave. So I, it's late afternoon for you. I understand. <laughs> Ciao, guys. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Ciao.